Now for Detroit, the motherland is Canada. That's how we started. We were not founded or established by a group of Englishmen sailing across the Atlantic. They didn't venture up the St. Lawrence. We were founded and established by the French and the colony they created, of which we were a part, was called Canada. And Cadillac is not only the name of a car, it's also the name of an explorer who arrived in 1701 and founded Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit. So the, the Fort of Detroit, it was part of French Canada. Our major connections from the beginning of our history in Detroit was not with Washington, D.C. Our major contact was with Montreal. And in fact, that's where the people came from. They came to Montreal, and then from Montreal, they came down to, uh, to Detroit. Our government was up there uh, in Quebec. And in fact, the language that was spoken here, you can tell it from many of the streets in Detroit, including Detroit, which are mispronounced. <laughs> um, they, they, they spoke French. Uh, so we were intimately a part of Canada. And even when the British came in 1760 and defeated the French and took Quebec and took Montreal and finally arrived at Fort Detroit and took Fort Detroit, uh, we were part of the British colony of Canada. Canada became part of British North America. And in fact, when the American Revolution took place, the American revolutionaries never got here. They couldn't. There was a British army here. Detroit was one of the major places for the British resistance to the American revolutionaries. This was the major center for capturing Americans and scalping them. Many American scalps <laughs> passed through uh, Fort Detroit. I mean, Colonel Hamilton, who was here, who was the British officer, I mean, he was the, the great defender of the Northwest Territories against the Americans. And in 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed, they drew the boundary down the middle of the Detroit River, and Fort Detroit ended up on the American side. But despite that fact, we still were part of Canada. The British refused to give up Detroit to the Americans because after the Revolutionary War, one-third of the American population, having refused to sign up for the Revolution, were hounded and persecuted. They're called, they were called the Tories. They were tarred and feathered. You want to talk about the American Civil Liberties Union having a heyday, do you understand? <laughs> they were tarred and feathered. Their property was taken from them. Close to 50,000 loyalist refugees fled their American home. They were driven out because they were loyal to their king and loyal to their government. They thought they were patriots. They were driven out and close to 50,000 of them crossed over to the one British colony, or one of two, that the American revolutionaries couldn't take. They couldn't take Nova Scotia and they couldn't take Canada. At that time they were separate colonies. They remained in British hands. And so the Loyalists poured over and the British government said to the Americans, we will not surrender Detroit to you until you pay money to compensate what you did to the Loyalists. 
So in 1783, Detroit never joined the United States of America. It was still part of Canada. In 1791, uh, the British decided to divide Canada into two parts. Uh, Lower Canada, which became the ancestor of Quebec, and Upper Canada, which had almost no people except in Detroit, uh, which later on became Ontario. And in fact, in 1791, the first election was held in Detroit, ever held in Detroit. It was a Canadian election. That is, Detroiters were asked to vote for a representative to the new parliament of Upper Canada, which was meeting in a town that was just created. It's very familiar to people doing summer tourism. It was called Newark. It's now called Niagara on the Lake. That's why it's a lovely little British colonial capital you love to go to. So the first election resulted in the election of somebody called Macomb. He was one of those French farmers. Did he know he was going to end up with a county? I mean, you know. That, 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 yeah. I mean, there were many families that came later that were much more important, but they didn't come at the what? At the right time. So. Uh, Monsieur Macomb goes off to Niagara on the Lake, not to see the Shaw Festival, <laughs> but to attend the first parliamentary meeting. Detroit was part of Canada. It wasn't until 1796 when John Jay, who was to become the first Chief Justice of the American Supreme Court, went to England to negotiate a treaty. It wasn't until then that the British consented to give up Detroit. And so it was in 1796 when mad, he was crazy, not so, mad General Anthony Wayne. And he, everything's named after him, right? Nobody even knows about him. If I ask you, give me two biographical details about Anthony Wayne. We all go around saying Wayne, 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 Wayne University, Wayne County, the whole thing. Well, who knows? And Mr. Macomb, what do we know? So mad General Anthony Wayne uh, now arrives in the area. He sends forward his uh, advance force under Colonel Proctor, and they arrive in 1796, in the summer of 1796, to take down the British flag, to remove Detroit from Canada, and to put up the American flag. When they did, almost all the people in Detroit moved across to Amherstburg. They did not wish to live under the American flag. The French were in particular um, concerned about the arrival of the Americans because the Americans were aggressive Protestants. And they were afraid that their own Catholic religion would be uh, assaulted by uh, the Americans. So, and the Scots merchants for sure weren't going to stay under the Americans. So they went across and they founded a whole new fort called Fort Malden, which you can go and visit in Amherstburg if, you, if you're on your way to Bablo, which is no longer an amusement park. All right, so, um, and, um, and Amherstburg was built as the town next to the fort which turned into a shipping yard so the British could build a fleet on Lake Erie to prevent the Americans from crossing. So, we were part of Canada. And then, all of a sudden, this border turned hostile. That is, Detroit's on one side of the border, and most of the people who live there <laughs> are on the other side of the border. Well, the Americans, of course, are very, very ambitious. Um, they failed in the American Revolution to take Canada. They want it. And in fact, they wait for a supreme moment. The supreme moment is around 1812. In 1812, the British are so occupied with fighting the French under Napoleon that they couldn't possibly defend Canada. So it's at that moment that uh, General Hull, a revolutionary hero uh, who has been assigned 
Uh, he's gotten older and fatter, but it's okay. Uh, who has now been assigned to uh, Detroit to lead the invasion of Canada, proceeds to invade Canada. And the whole invasion turns out to be an embarrassing disaster. As I have said on other occasions, I went to the Detroit public schools for many years, and I was a good student. I must tell you that nobody told me <laughs> about the terrible defeat of the Americans in the War of 1812. It was an Do you remember? No. It's called doctored history for purposes of patriotism. He crossed over and the whole army was defeated by a few hundred British who were left and leftover Indians, Amerindians, who didn't want the Americans around because the Americans weren't interested in fur, they were interested in bringing settlers. Defeated. And in fact, there's a great tribute. If you go to Niagara-on-the-Lake and you go a little south on your way to Niagara Falls, you'll get to Queenston Heights, and there up on the heights, the wonderful restaurant overlooking the river, don't miss it. Uh, and there is the statue of General Isaac Brock. Uh, he was the, uh, the great defender, if you will, of Upper Canada against the American invaders. The War of 1812 turned out to be a disaster for the United States of America. Detroit itself was captured and rejoined Canada for a whole year before uh, an American admiral who sailed Lake Erie created an American fleet at Sandusky. Can you imagine this? Cedar Point. <laughs> created an American fleet and set sail for Putin Bay. <laughs> And there he met the British fleet coming from Amherstburg. I mean, it was the war zone. His name was Oliver Hazard Perry. And on September the 10th, uh, 1813, he defeated the British fleet, and that made the holding of Detroit impossible for the British. They began retiring, and then the American troops crossed over and followed them all the way almost to London, Ontario, which at that time did not exist. But the river did that goes through London. It's called the Thames. And there on the Thames was fought the famous Battle of the Thames, uh, in which uh, the British were uh, defeated, and the famous Indian leader who cooperated with them was killed. His name was Tecumseh. We have a whole town in Michigan called uh, Tecumseh, which is named after him. He was like Pontiac. Uh, he was trying to defend Indian rights, and he felt the British could better do that. Well, despite that, the march on Quebec and Montreal never took place. They tried to cross to take Niagara on the lake, and a lady who must have made candy called Laura Secord, I don't know. <laughs> She's the Betsy Ross of Canada, do you understand? Uh, the whole, with, with her help, well, the whole American invasion was a disaster. Canada was not retaken, and in fact the border remained hostile because the American intention was always there. Why not? I mean, doesn't North America belong to us? It should. I mean, why didn't we get Canada in the Revolution? We should have. There were, actually, in the Revolution, not 13 colonies. There were 16. In addition to the 13 that made it, there was Canada, there was Nova Scotia, and the British had taken Florida mm -hmm. from uh, the Spanish. Well, Florida was given back to the Spanish, and Nova Scotia and Canada now ended up uh, independent, but the, the boundary, the Detroit River, was a war zone. Hard to believe. Well, and it remained a very, very problematic place, but all I'm saying is the connection of Detroit to Canada, do you understand? I know we're in the same country as Mississippi. What is our connection to Mississippi? You tell me. <laughs> I don't even understand sometimes people who come. 
I mean, I go to Ontario all the time. What would my life be without the Stratford Festival and the Shaw Festival in Toronto? You tell me. When I talk about Detroit, people say, well, what's wonderful about Detroit? I always say it's right next to Canada. <laughs> no, no, it's right next to Canada. I mean, that's, that's what makes it so terrific. So, but that, it was uh, that war zone. And, and that border, by the way, remained a hostile border because during the Civil War, while much of the British public sympathized with Lincoln and the North, the British government and the British leaders of industry, the cotton industry in particular, favored the Confederacy. They thought they would be able to become the patrons of the Confederacy. They would get cotton cheaper. And so they supported it, and I don't know whether you realize it, there were many forays that came out of Canada from the North, that was the whole plan, to attack the North from the North. So when the Civil War was over, the American government was furious. But over time, the hostile frontier turned uh, friendly. It was simply inevitable. The business future, the economic future of this place up in the north could not lie with Great Britain. Its economic future had to lie with the country that was closest by with which it could more easily do business. It was the United States of America. So in time, it's interesting how easy it is for people to forget the hostilities were forgotten. And in fact, when my granduncle first came to Detroit in the 1880s, he uh, used to tell me that, um, and I'm not sure that I believed him because I couldn't imagine that the whole river froze over. There had to be a channel where the ships could go through. But he used to tell me that you could walk across uh, on, a, no, no, on, a frozen, uh, on a frozen January day, there was no customs official, no passport, nothing. That's, so the hostile frontier turned into a what? A kind of friendly uh, frontier, and you could cross the whole place. And that, in fact, that's the border that I remember, right? Going to Canada was like going to Ohio. Did you think you were going to a foreign country? No. Did you need a passport? Did you even need a birth certificate? They simply said, where were you born? He said, Detroit. And that was it, through the whole thing. So uh, I mention this because it is so interesting that Detroit has had such a great connection with Canada. And through the years after the border became peaceful, one of the main entry points for Canadians who were moving to the United States of America was Detroit. A, a large part of the population of the Detroit area has its origin in Canada. How many people in this room have a Canadian origin? Well, there you are. So there you are. They came through, it's one of the major ports of, of entry, and when Detroit boomed in the 1920s, there were thousands and hundreds of thousands of Canadians looking for good jobs who crossed the Detroit River and came to Detroit. So what is amazing is, given all this connection, how little we know about Canada. See, I can ask Detroit, who is the Prime Minister of France? Well, say, you know, they read it. Chirac. Uh, I can ask them, um, who are the major uh, music stars of England. Mention Canada. Surveys have indicated that one way to make an article boring is to put the word Canada in it. <laughs> if people see Canada, they don't, <laughs> they don't read the article. Is that not amazing? All right. Now, <laughs> the country of Canada is the second largest country in the world territorially. It has 3,850,000 square miles. Most of it frozen, but that doesn't make a difference. 
If you're just counting area, got it? <coughs> like the Russians, they've got Siberia. You know, most of it is empty, but if you're talking about land, you can look at the map almost all the way to the North Pole is all this area, close to four million square miles. It is larger than the United States of America, including Alaska. It's huge. That's why I can never figure out why property costs in Toronto are so high. <laughs> That's very interesting. In this country with so much space, they're all squeezed <laughs> into these little, uh, little enclaves. Uh, like Australia in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, the area uh, is bounded obviously by the Atlantic Ocean on the east and the Pacific Ocean on the, on the west. Uh, what describes Canada, obviously, is its latitude. Most of it is almost hostile to human habitation. Uh, to live on Baffin Island, I once met somebody who did, and uh, they described life on Baffin Island. I mean, you just, if you stick your nose out in the middle of January, just uh, out the window or out the door, it's what? You have to go to the doctor. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's frozen. So it's, I mean, it, it's uh, a massive assault, if you will, on, uh, on survival. Now, the first problem of Canada was to keep from getting conquered by the United States of America. And it successfully did it, not because of the Canadians, it did it because of the British. It was part of the British Empire, and the British Empire was the largest land empire in the world and it, under no circumstances was prepared to surrender Canada to the revolutionaries. So it survived. But Canada has suffered all these other problems, you see, and it's a, it's a very problematic country, which makes it a very interesting country if people would only pay attention. First, Canada is like Belgium. and many other countries in the world. It had, from the beginning, two nations living in it that hated each other. Okay. One were the French, who were the original Europeans. And now I'm excluding, the, there were other nations. There were Amerindians, there were what? Eskimo Inuits, I mean obviously. But in terms of the awareness of the population, there were two nations. Uh, one were the original French, and then opposing them, their conquerors were the English. And the tension between the two has been the continuing story of Canada. You can write all the pamphlets you want about Canadian unity and how all Canadians are one nation, and I get all this thing. I get the pamphlets. Uh, the point is, it's not true. There is a very deep division in the country, and in fact, it most likely is true that people in Ontario have an easier time relating to people in Michigan <laughs> than they have relating to people in Quebec. Just because they're in the same political entity doesn't mean it necessarily works. And then, for the English Canadians, who are the overwhelming majority, some 80% of Canada, when I say English Canadians, I mean Canadians who've ended up speaking English. They may have spoken Ukrainian, do you understand? They may have spoken something else, but they ended up speaking English. For the 80%, their question is, how do you tell the difference between <laughs> an English-speaking Canadian and an American? Well, you say. One says about, <laughs> and the other one says about. One of the continuous frustrations that uh, English-speaking Canadians have when they travel is that nobody can tell the difference. I mean, in order to tell the difference, they have to wear a large Canadian flag. <laughs> Do you understand? Uh, around? Because 
if they spoke BBC English, had they given up the English they were speaking in North America, after all, the founding Englishmen of Canada came from the American colonies. They didn't speak what we would call BBC English. For most people listening to them who are foreigners, they can't tell the difference between American English and Canadian English. They can tell the difference between American English and what we call British English. They can't tell the difference. So if you're in a separate country, how do you distinguish yourself? What makes a Canadian, a Canadian, different from an English-speaking American? It's been one of the great struggles. The third, of course, was that what gave Canada importance when I was a child, in Windsor there flew a flag, the Union Jack. Remember the Union Jack? It was the flag of Great Britain, and it was the flag that flew all over Canada. Canada was part of the British Empire, so what was very important to Canada was if people said, you're a nothing country, you got a few million people, it's all frozen around here, got it? Who are you? Canadians would answer, certainly back in 1850 or 1860. We are part of the British Empire and the sun never sets, do you understand, on the British Empire. How can you compare this little nothing United States to the British Empire? It gave them identity. It gave them pride. That's who they were. That's what they were. And then the British made a colossal mistake. They lost their empire. <laughs> I mean, they, they, could, they couldn't hang on to their, to their empire. So now this empire is falling apart. The English can no longer maintain it. So what's left of your identity? Who are you? One of the problems of Canada was always population. It was easy to persuade people to move to the United States. The economy was dynamic and the climate was tolerable generally, even in Detroit. But Canada was like, like a major frozen what? Waste. I mean, there's an area in Canada where the weather is tolerable. It lies south of the Ottawa River. It's this little thing that projects into the United States of America. The rest of it is what? And maybe Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. It's cold. It's an overwhelming challenge, I, I want to tell you. The consumption of energy by the average Canadian is greater than that of the average American. Do you know why? They've got to stay warm. <laughs> I mean, do, do, do you understand the amount of energy required just, just to, stay, uh, to stay warm? Even Inuits now, in their igloos, have central heating. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, the point is, it, it's, it's a major, uh, major challenge. And then in recent years, one of the challenges of the Canadians, you see, is how to relate to the United States of America because, after all, in order to survive, once the British Empire declined, there was no possibility that if the United States of America wanted to take Canada, that they couldn't take Canada, right? It'd be easy, right? Cross the border, no Canadian force could what? Resist it. So in the end, Canada was forced to cooperate, to be obsequious, to pretend to be nice, <laughs> because otherwise there was no chance for, for survival. But then you get tired of that, and now America gets a government. The government is under President George Bush, Jr. And in fact, he says to the Canadians, who he expects always to be cooperative, he says, I'm conducting a war in Iraq, and you're either for me or against me. What's your choice? Well, he knew what answer to expect. The answer, of course, of course, of course, we're always with you. We're, we're, we're always with you. We need tourists in Stratford and Shaw Festival. No, yes, no, no, we're with you. 
But what happened was the opposite. It's part of the crisis of Canada. I mean, the Canadians looked at the United States of America and said, no. No! No! Americans were never used to hearing that answer from the Canadians. What do you mean saying no? That's problematic. And the only way that Canada can work is it has to have a strong central government. Because without a strong central government, the tension between the English and the French and whatever is so great that it can't function. And for many years it enjoyed that. There were great figures. Um, most of them were English Canadians, some of them were uh, French Canadians. Um, there was MacDonald, who was like the first Prime Minister of the United Canada. There was Wilfrid Laurier, you know, he was one of them. And then there was the man I remember from my childhood, who was like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He never lost an election, he was just the continuing ruler of Canada. His name, uh, he was an interesting bachelor, his name was Mackenzie King. Some of you may remember Mackenzie King. I, I always associated him, I thought he was the permanent ruler of, of Canada. But what you had were viable central governments. But right now, the central government is sort of collapsing into chaos. And that's the reason why Canada has been chosen as a hotspot. Do most Americans know that? No, because whenever they see the word Canada in a headline, they what? <laughs> they turn. Uh, they turn the page. Well, in order to tell you uh, about the present crisis, to tell you about what's happening in Canada, I have to tell you the story of Canada. And uh, let me just start the story with, obviously, uh, the first people who came there. They came from Asia. They're called the Amerindians. And in fact, the Amerindians of Canada correspond to the Amerindians of the United States of America, because the boundary of Canada is artificial. The natural boundaries in North America go north and south. Got it? The Rockies are a boundary, aren't they? <coughs> that goes what? It should go east and west, but it doesn't go east and west. It goes north and south. Then you got the prairie. Well, the whole prairie area, uh, the, is there like a big mountain right in the middle there? No, it's just the what? There's the whole, it's north and south. So everything runs north and south. Those are the natural divisions of North America. And uh, what has happened um, is that when the Amerindians came, that's how they divided. There were the coastal Amerindians. They didn't know about a boundary here. <laughs> there wasn't any. There were the prairie ones, right, same, same group. And then uh, over here in the east, there were the Woodland Indians, most of whom belonged to a group, whether they were in Michigan or Ontario, it's the same group. They're called Algonquin Amerindians, and in fact, uh, they stretched all the way north almost to the Arctic, but in the Arctic area, there was another Asian group that had come across from Siberia. We used to call them by a word that is now politically incorrect. So when you ask for art in Ontario, never ask for Eskimo art. Do not use that word. It is absolutely not kosher. The new word, and you have to train yourself for it, because the word Eskimo was just part of my what? My, my vocabulary. The new word, I'm cautioning you, is Inuit. I-N-U-I-T. Uh, that is the word they prefer to be called by. And the Inuits were not Amerindians, they belonged to a what? Another group, a group adapted to, do you understand, the far, far, far north. They were there. Well, the second uh, entry came from Europe. They were the French, they sailed up the St. Lawrence at the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, in the 16th century, an explorer called Jacques Cartier uh, came there, but nothing happened after him. But at the beginning of the 17th century, Samuel Champlain, uh, Champlain, or whatever, came in uh, to the area and established the colony of what we call Canada today. 
And in fact, the French were to remain there, uh, bringing settlers between 1608 and their departure in 1763. All right, so the, between that period of time, uh, about 100,000, not a lot. One of the reasons why there weren't a lot was that the French decided to build the economy of Canada not on agriculture, which was problematic in the climate anyway. They decided to build it on fur. Well, you don't need a lot of people to what? To catch the furry animals, do you understand? You can use the Amerindians for that. They bring it to the fort, then you buy it, then you what? You transport it and you sell it. Um, so the French population was never large. Uh, one of the major forts under the French, of course, was Fort Detroit. The third entry, of course, was the coming of the English or the British, because a lot of the people who came were not only English, they were Scots. They were the great merchants. And in fact, uh, the French had already established two major cities. One was called Quebec and one was called Montreal in Lower Canada. The British came, they took it, they settled there. The Scots merchants came, and that's why the most, if you go to Montreal, some of the most important institutions in Montreal are named after Scots, including the university that everybody wants to go to, which is called McGill. So uh, the Scots are very important. The reason why we say in Windsor, about, <laughs> instead of about, is not because of the English. We say that because all the Scots came uh, to Canada. They were part of what we would call the British invasion, the British uh, arrival. Now, um, when the British came uh, back in 1760, uh, they created uh, what is called British North America, which stretched all the way from the Arctic Ocean to the tip of Florida. It's called the first British Empire, and in fact, uh, Canada was joined, but the British had a problem, and this is very important. In the colonies they had created, they didn't have this problem because there were virtually no Catholics except in Maryland. But they now took French territory, and the French were overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, and the Catholic religion was outlawed in England. So they made a compromise, it's very interesting. Um, they made a deal with the church. The deal they made with the church was that they would, if the church leaders cooperated, and they were the major leaders of the people since the secular leaders had been defeated, if the church cooperated, the British would grant them toleration, the rights to control the education of their children and whatever. So uh, a deal was made. A deal was made between the leaders of the French, who were the clergy, and the English, which remained one of the reasons why the French did not want the Americans to take Canada. You think they would to defeat the British, right? One of the reasons was they knew that if the Americans came, since they were all raving Protestants, that they would, in some ways, assault the privileges of the Roman Catholic Church, which had been granted by the British government, and all of that was reinforced by the French Revolution. When the French Revolution took place a few years later in France, the French disestablished the Roman Catholic Church, the revolutionaries. So now, the French in Quebec or in Canada weren't so sure they wanted to return to to France because it had a revolutionary government. So a kind of an alliance was made between the British and the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church in Canada. It was, it was to make Canada a viable possession uh, for the British. The next, of course, was the American Revolution, which split British North America. The southern part became the United States of America, and the northern part was now uh, basically two colonies. Uh, Nova Scotia, which had been taken by the British already back in 1748, 
and Canada and a huge area, most of what today we call Canada, was owned by a corporation. It was a fur trading corporation. You run across its department stores when you go to Canada. It's called Hudson's Bay. They owned, I'll tell you what they owned. They owned all of northern Quebec, all of or northern Ontario, all of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, the Northwest Territories, the whole thing. They most likely owned three million square miles. Because those GM was to own Montana, Utah, Colorado, whatever it was. And they had uh, privileges of managing the fur trade that was there. So between Canada and Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia was to break up into three, uh, three colonies, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, and Canada, and Hudson's Bay Territory. There was still a vast territory left in the north to the British, most of it undeveloped, which was called British North America. But what happened was, and I referred to it, close to 50,000 Americans, Englishmen, who thought themselves to be American Englishmen, crossed the border as refugees and became the founding English population of Canada. How do these people feel about the United States of America? They hated it, even though they were ethnically related and religiously related. They hated it. It was the enemy. When you cross over to Windsor, they don't have the daughters of the American Revolution. <laughs> the D-A-R that won't let Marian Anderson sing in their, in, the, you know, in their hall. You've got the daughters of the empire. You have all those people whose ancestors were the loyalists who fought for their king, do you understand? Who remained loyal to their government. So, so their vision of the American Revolution is entirely different. This was the founding race of, uh, of Canada. Well, the next is what we call the develop. The British now have this place. It's very clear the Americans want it. The only way to keep the Americans from taking it is to bring people. So they put advertisements in all these British newspapers. And the poorest people decide to emigrate. The poorest people in Britain are Scots. They come out of the highlands, they come out of the lowlands, I don't know where they come from. I mean, they're coming out. John Galbraith wrote a book, he was born in western Ontario. He wrote a book about the Scots in Ontario, the Canadian Scots. They're incredible. I love going to Stratford and to Shaw Festival, because my favorite thing, which I don't eat too often, are those butter tarts. Do you know the butter tarts? Does anybody know those Scottish butter tarts? Oh, they are, absolutely. Anyway, the, the whole thing, and the Scots were into education. They built schools and hospitals and whatever it was. I mean, they poured into Canada. Most of them didn't stay in, upper, in lower Canada. In Quebec, they moved on to Ontario, and Ontario is now filled, you understand, with Europeans. They're the Scots, if they hadn't populated the place. In 1838, they send a surveyor by the name of Lord Durham, he's not a surveyor with a, an instrument, I mean he was a, a nobleman, to see what they could do about the English-French problem. Durham came up with a solution, which was the policy of the English government from 1838 until 1867. The policy is, and Durham said, I've noticed that many of the natives are speaking French. That is intolerable. What we need to do is to persuade them to speak a civilized language. That language is English. In that way, we will preserve the unity of this colony and prevent the Americans from taking it. So there now was instituted uh, a policy whereby Quebec and Ontario were merged. And the policy of anglifying the population went on, but it failed. What did work was the economic development. What failed was the attempt to merge the English and French by forcing the French to speak English. Uh, in case we're self-righteous about problems, we should recognize that in California we have a what? <laughs> no, no, it's a similar problem. In the end, are we going to compel all the Spanish-speaking people who cross the border from Mexico to give up Spanish as their first and major 
language, I, um, I don't know. Uh, but there it is. Uh, and then, after the Civil War, America was really mad. So the Canadians are really afraid. Lincoln was assassinated, but now there's all this talk in Washington. They got this big army left over from the Civil War. What to do with it? March north! So in response to it, the British government decides to merge all the British colonies into one dominion. Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and they merged them into a single country on July 1st, 1867, which was called the Dominion of Canada, a self-governing colony of such size that it wasn't called a colony, it was called a dominion, but at the head of the dominion was the Queen of England, her name was Queen uh, Victoria, and then in 1869, the Dominion of Canada, uh, wanting to prevent the Americans from moving in to the Northwest, purchased the whole territory of the Hudson Bay Company, now creating, uh, next to Russia, the largest country in the, <laughs> in the world. It was fairly empty, but there it was. It was all in defiance of the United States of America. And the Dominion of Canada was created in response to the danger that was felt after the Civil War. The thing is coming together, and they find fairly extraordinary leadership. But now, having created this political entity, how were they going to make it work? Actually, in 1871, another British colony, which had nothing to do with Canada, which was founded along the Pacific, which was called British Columbia, decides to join the federations. So now, how, how do you make this country work? If British Columbia is part of Canada, how do you send a message <laughs> from, from Canada to British Columbia? In order to make this country viable, you have to build an infrastructure of roads and railroads. Otherwise, it's what? Not going to work. At this time, the United States was building the Union, remember the Union Pacific, they were working on this whole thing to connect New York and San Francisco. And now it was proposed that the only way to make Canada work was to build a railroad. So they did. Actually, they built two railroads ultimately, but the first, which crossed the Canadian Pacific, uh, went all the way, you could go from Montreal all the way ultimately to Vancouver in British Columbia. And they, they moved through really problematic area because construction in the winter in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, can you imagine building, but they built it. Now that's what defined Canada. If you look at where Canadian people live, most of them are within a few miles <laughs> of the railroad. Uh, in Quebec, even uh, if you look at northern Ontario and if you go across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia, the settlements all follow the railroad. The railroad helped to create and to unify uh, Canada. It was a major, major feat. And then they invited thousands and thousands of more people to come. They had to fill up the spaces in the West. They had run out of Scots. They kept advertising in Scotland, but there weren't any left. The Poles and the Slovaks and the Germans, they were all heading to the United States of America. Some Germans ended up in uh, Canada. We know that because uh, just uh, east of Stratford is Kitchener, the name of which used to be Berlin prior to World War I. They changed it after the name of the great British commander because German names weren't popular in World War I. But many Germans came. But they found one group of people who were used to freezing in the winter. <laughs> they were called the Ukrainians. 
and the Ukrainians now came and they moved into the West. They, uh, along, now you had the railroad, right? You put them on, in Montreal, you put them on the train, you, uh, you ship them out. They arrive in January <laughs> uh, somewhere in Saskatchewan. Now the Hudson Bay Territory has been divided up into three provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, Manitoba. And so now the plains are filled up, all these people moving in. For the French, this was a big question. What language would immigrants speak when they came? Would they choose French or English? Well, you can figure out what they chose. The English were in charge. Why would you learn the language of the defeated people? You would always learn the language of the government. The language of the government was English. So all the immigrants who came to Canada learned English. So now the English-speaking uh, majority only gets what? Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the next step to Canada, which was part of the problem, the British government wanted to keep Canada attached to England but it was economically impossible. First of all, the empire was declining, and second of all, the economy of the United States was what? Was rising. So in the end, despite the British government, the ties between Canada and the United States were inevitable. If you cut timber in Canada, a logical place to ship it was what? The United States. If you grew grain in Canada, a logical place to ship it was the United States of America. If you mined ore in Canada, a logical place to ship it where they needed it was the United States. So at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, there now developed something that is the great frustration of Canada. So let me explain. In British Columbia, if people in British Columbia are shipping, are they mainly shipping across to Quebec? No. They're shipping south to Washington, Oregon, and California. If they're in Manitoba, uh, they're shipping south into what we call the United States. And the same thing is true uh, here. Uh, initially, there was this movement toward Europe and toward England. Ultimately, the north-south lines and it still applies. If Canadians go on vacation, do they go to Winnipeg? <laughs> no, they go to Florida. No, they go to Florida. They end up in California. The lines of North America are what? They're logically north-south lines. And then, as Canada is getting more prosperous, but simultaneously more Americanized, in 1929, the Depression hits. And the Depression is to create a situation in Canada that is different from the United States. So let me try to explain the difference. It's a, actually a sort of a big difference. Um, one of the responses to the Depression was something called socialism. Now, in America, you can't use the word socialist. You, could use, you used to be able to use the word liberal, <laughs> but you certainly couldn't use the word socialist. There were socialist parties. They got absolutely what? Nowhere. Was Norman Thomas a nice guy? Yes. Did it go anywhere? The answer is no. No major political party in the United States ever used the name socialist. It was absolutely a no-no. The Democrats in the New Deal might pick up socialist ideas in creating the welfare state, but they could never label them what? Socialist. But in response to the Depression, there arose two socialist parties in Canada. Canada, in this case, was influenced by the rise of the Labour Party in England, which did use the word socialist. And so that's part of the British influence, the European influence. One of the parties that arose in the West, in the prairies, was a party that today is called the New Democratic Party. And it was created by desperate farmers. 
Their farms were failing. They needed government help. Now, in America, we did help the farmers. We still are. We give them subsidies. Do we call it socialist? No. Most of these farmers vote Republican. <laughs> Do they know they're receiving a socialist subsidy? The answer is no, because we can't use the word what? Social. But in Canada, they could use it. So now, a socialist party takes over. Prior to that time, there were two parties. Prior to that time in Canada, there was the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party was pro-English. They hated the French. <laughs> and then there were the Liberals. The Liberals were basically people who were willing to work with the French. <laughs> Got it? That's what it meant to be liberal. And now, in the middle of it all, there arrives in the West, defeating both the liberals and the conservatives, this socialist party. Something that didn't exist across the border in the United States of America. In Quebec, another kind of socialist party arises. You have to realize that Adolf Hitler had a word in his party's name. It was called National Socialist. He was a socialist, but he wasn't what was called an international socialist like the commies. He was a what? A patriotic national socialist. Well, in Quebec there now arises a party which is also duplicated in Alberta and British Columbia. It's called Social Credit. What was the policy of Social Credit? Their policy was that the government should print more money <laughs> and share it with the people. Now you have to imagine how the bankers <laughs> you know, felt about it. Do, do you understand? Print more money and share it with the people. Give people money. Now that's certainly a kind of socialist enterprise, but it also had what I would call a fascist edge. It was a little bit like National Socialist because tied up with the Social Credit Party was a paranoid fear of the enemies who control money in the world and they were the Jews. Okay, so. So uh, the Social Credit Party now arises in Quebec and receives a big following. It arises in uh, Alberta and British Columbia and you've now got the other regular Socialist Party, right? The, the ultimately the New Democratic Party. The politics in Canada are transformed by the Depression in a way that they were not transformed in the United States of, uh, of America. Well, following the war, the fortunes of both parties declines. Not completely. They, they still hang in there, the New Democratic Party and the Social Credit Party. They take on different names as they move along. They have advertisers that help them. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, the liberals and conservatives reassert themselves and after World War II, after the terrible war in which Canada participated, Canada now wants to revive its strength. And the only way they can do it is to increase the population. Do you remember how boring Toronto was before World War II? It was the most boring city in North America. If you went there on a Sunday, there wasn't anything open. You couldn't even get an ice cream cone. It was absolutely and totally... Tom, where are you going? Hey, we got a blog in here talking to me. Did you got a rubber arm? It's has. Huh? Pitcher has a rubber arm. If education is important to you, talk to your child's school about raising academic standards. Call 1-800-38-BE-SMART for a free booklet and be a big league parent. Boring. And then, in the 50s, Canada opened its doors to literally millions of immigrants. They poured in. 
the Portuguese and the Germans and the Dutch, do you understand? They changed Toronto. That's why you have all those interesting neighborhoods. They didn't exist before World War II. They were the creation of the post-World War II time. They poured all the way across Canada and then they opened their doors to Asians. Well, there was, China was sort of closed by then, but Hong Kong was open. And all these Hong Kong Chinese are now pouring through what? Vancouver. They will ultimately create the best restaurants in Windsor. No, I mean, they will get all the way. They move. Canada is transformed by this immigration into a multi ethnic nation. What language do most of these immigrants choose to use? English. So for the French, they're going absolutely crazy. They can see the Canadian, it's a plot. They can see the Canadian government opening what? The doors to millions of people who will pour into the country and like the United States of America, they will all learn English, which will push the French into being a, just a what? A little minority. Now all of that, therefore, was to lead to the Great Rebellion. So, uh, but along the way, before the Great Rebellion, the Canadians had developed a culture of their own. It was a kind of combination. Um, they spoke American English, but they had a British queen. <laughs> no, no, no. They had uh, a, Br a British-style parliament, didn't they? They didn't have a president. They had a, uh, a prime minister, uh, sort of like the British. So they, they felt connected both across the ocean to Great Britain and also to America. It was a culture dominated by English. When I was a child and you crossed to Windsor, there were no French signs. The language that reigned in Canada was English. If you were in Quebec, you could find French, but not in Ontario and certainly not in Manitoba and certainly not in Alberta. The third part of it was because the economic development of Canada followed that of the United States to some degree. People comment on it. Canadians are slower. You know, what they mean is the, the pace of life in the towns uh, was slower, less hectic than that of the United States of America. The passion was not basketball. I mean, I, I do want to tell you, there is a sport that is built for people living in what? Frozen climates. It's called hockey. I'm always amazed when they got hockey teams in Los Angeles. I mean, like, what, what, are they, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? I mean, it's the, the passion. The culture, by the way, was socialistic because uh, it was easier for Canadians having accepted the concept of socialism as being perfectly legitimate after World War II to create the kinds of welfare systems that existed in Europe. One of the signs of it was that after World War II, the Canadians created something that the, the, the Bush administration would go crazy about. They created what is called a universal health service, right? Every Canadian is covered by uh, health uh, coverage. Um, and uh, rich, poor, it doesn't make any difference. It was all part of what we call this intrusion of socialistic ideas, which were acceptable in Canada and which were rejected by the United States after the Democrats and the New Deal were politically defeated. And the culture was Canadians simply sort of accepted the fact that they were subordinate to the United States of America. Certainly after World War II and the British Empire was gone and America was the leading power in the war against the Soviet Union, I mean, Washington called the shots. Did they like it? No. Did they sort of accept it? Yes. And then came the Great Rebellion. So now I want to talk about one of the most dashing political figures in the 20th century. You may remember him. George Eliot Trudeau. Does do you remember him? He didn't look like any previous Canadian Prime Minister. Most previous Canadian Prime Ministers looked like Mackenzie King. Do you remember like Mackenzie King? I mean, he could have sat in Queen Victoria's parlor and been a role model of appearance and behavior. 
Trudeau changed the model, so now let me try to describe the Great Rebellion. The Great Rebellion was triggered by what was happening in Quebec. In the 1960s, as things were hotting up in the United States of America, the change poured into Canada. The most conservative part of Canada in terms of lifestyle was Quebec. It was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. If they couldn't think of doing something, they always had a baby. No, 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 that was it. Today we said, what shall I do, what shall I do, what shall I do? Well, they, were, they didn't know what to do, they had a baby. And the church was dominant. It was inconceivable that this uh, hopelessly conservative part of Canada, which had repudiated the ideas of the French Revolution, could ever change. Well, in the 1960s, as the economy improved, as the immigrants poured in, all of a sudden there was an explosion in Quebec. All of a sudden, young people weren't going to church. And then they weren't getting married so early. And then they weren't having babies. And now they were organizing and demanding separation. We've had it. We're going to have all these English-speaking immigrants. Do you want to say, this country is, going to, is an English country. We want to run our own affairs. We are a nation. We are the founding nation of this so-called nation, Canada. So we want out. We want independence. Oh. Now, uh, the independence movement was not led to a large degree by the conservatives. It was led by these young radicals. It was the 60s. The 60s, wasn't it an amazing decade? Do you remember the 60s? I mean, none of you in this room has hair long enough even to fit. Uh, oh, no, uh, no, 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 uh, even to fit into the, <laughs> even to fit into the, into the 60s. So it was an incredible decade, and out of it came this politician. He was the son of a rich French-Canadian. Rich, rich, rich. Uh, he had gone off to study in the most famous uh, English schools, uh, in Canada and elsewhere. He went to the London School of Economics. He studied under Harold Lasky. I mean, he, the best, impeccable, um, well-mannered, brilliant, the whole thing. Uh, the only party that a French Canadian could join with self-respect was the Liberal Party. Uh, and so he joins the Liberal Party and he rises in the Liberal Party. And, <coughs> and in the 1960s, it is very clear that if Canada is going to survive, it's going to have to appease the French Canadians. And the best way to do that is to what? Choose a French Canadian leader. And his name is Trudeau. And Trudeau now becomes the leader and he says, appealing to both the English people and the French people, we are one nation, one Canada, we've got two cultures. And what we're going to do is, if French Canadians have to learn English, English Canadians need to learn French. Oh. You have to understand, most of the English speaking people I know who took four years of French at high school can't even ask for bread in Paris. <laughs> you understand? They can't even ask for bread in Paris. So, and now, all over Canada, to show it, we're going to have a sign. On the sign will be what? Two languages. This is a bilingual nation. We are going to tell those French Canadians they are part of this nation. We honor their culture. So now when you cross to Windsor, right, isn't it? Isn't it? Everywhere you go, you can be traveling miles and miles through English-speaking territory. All the public signs are both in English and French. That's Trudeau. And then... Trudeau says, in the government, most of the people, most of the workers in government are English Canadians. We're going to have affirmative action. We're going to give jobs. Do you understand important jobs to French Canadians? We're going to change this country. We're going to make them feel it's, they're part of it. That's Trudeau. It was a revolution. And now he said, Canada has every reason to exist. What unites us all? Well, we're different from the United States. One, we have a compassionate welfare policy. And two, and this is the image of Trudeau, 
The reason for Canada is that Canada is not one of the great nations, but is great enough to serve a role in world affairs. Oh, he used to show up for all the meetings. What role? We shall be a force for peace in the world. That's it. That's what he said. Meaning, we're going to be the arbitrators, the mediators, uh, whatever. And the sign of it was that when the Vietnam War started, and all these Vietnamese, not Vietnamese, or uh, anti-Vietnam War people who didn't want to serve in the American army flee to Canada, he doesn't arrest them and what? Return them. He lets them stay. Now that's the defiance of the United States, right? Sticking it in the eye. That's in defiance of the United States of America. We are no longer your little dog that follows you and you tell us what to do. The British Empire may not exist. That's okay. That's gone. We don't listen to Britain. And the sign that we don't listen to Britain, that we're fully independent, is that we're going to have our own constitution. You have to understand that in 1867, when Canada was founded, it was founded by a law passed by Parliament called the British North America Act, which meant that any changes to the fundamental law that governed Canada had to be made by the British Parliament. He says that is intolerable. He's looking at the French Canadians. You want to break the British connection? We're going to write our own constitution. And in fact, in 1982, I mean, Trudeau suddenly energized all these, do you want to say, all these people. But I do want to tell you that in the process, uh, there were complications. He had mobilized all the French Canadians. And now I want to tell you they're not having babies. The lowest birth rate in North America is in Quebec, if you can believe it. They have the highest birth rate. They now have the what? You, you, there aren't little children running around. They have the lowest birth rate, birth rate in North America. I mean, from the Trudeau uh, era. But what happened was, Many of the, of the radicals said, it's not enough. We want independence. So now a man by the name of René Levesque organizes a party, Parti Québécois, and he says, this is a party for independence. Trudeau is a traitor. He's making deals with the English. It will not work. So now he is elected the premier of Quebec, and now he flies only, he doesn't like the Canadian flag anymore which they've changed to accommodate the French Canadians. They got rid of all those little Union Jack things, and they put a big maple, I, I, I happen to think the flag is attractive, red and white, very nice, with a big maple leaf in the middle, but it's a new flag. He didn't want to fly that flag, he's going to fly the what? The Quebec flag with the fleur-de-lis and yellow, remember the yellow and blue flag, and there it is. So it's defiance of Trudeau, and Trudeau doesn't know what to do. Meanwhile, some of these radicals engage in acts of terrorism. They blow things up. And Trudeau is forced to call on the Canadian Army to come in to create law and order. And in the middle of it all, there arrives a Frenchman by the name of Charles de Gaulle. He stands up there on the balcony somewhere, I don't know, the Chateau Frontenac, I'm not sure where he is. He's pretty tall, everybody can see him. And he then talks to the French audience, obviously in French and refers to Quebec as Quebec Libre. Free Quebec. What do you mean, free Quebec? Is de Gaulle supporting the separatist movement in Canada? I mean, what, what? We, we invited him to a party. We paid for his transport. I mean, the whole thing, I mean, what's he doing here? <laughs> so, what was supposed to be a reconciliation turns out to be a, uh, a problem. But the problem continues. That is, he did mobilize the people, he did change Canada in many ways, but it also triggered a response. Now, the, the response is very interesting. The people in the West, who are hopelessly English, said, what, 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 why are we even in a connection here? 
Most of our connections are with Washington, Oregon. I mean, why are we enduring uh, all these demands from Quebec? Why are we, who have found oil, they found oil in Alberta, huge reserves of oil. And so the poor West now becomes rich, especially in Alberta. The first oil in Canada was found near Sarnia. A little town called Petrolia. I recommend you go there. It's a tourist spot around here. And in fact, there was so much oil that half the oil poured out of the ground into the St. Clair River. They didn't even know how to control it. But then they ran out of oil at the end of the 1880s. And then in Alberta, they found this oil. And now there is wealth. And these people are saying, why are we enduring? This is an English-speaking country. Why can't those French get it through their head? In addition, Alberta now gets influenced by something from the United States of America, from Texas. Why Texas? Well, you need somebody to help you with the what? Get the oil out of the ground. The Texans now arrive, and the next thing you know, in Alberta, there now arrives a fundamentalist Protestant culture. And the fundamentalist Protestant culture will take the Social Credit Party and turn it into another party that's conservative, doesn't like the French, and wants an English-speaking Canada that doesn't have socialism. Ooh. It will ultimately take the name of the Reform Party, and now they stick their fingers out and they say to Quebec, you either behave or leave. You leave, I'll tell you what, you leave. And that means that all this money that we make from oil that goes into the federal coffers will not be used for your health service. Go on, you, you, leave. <laughs> then there were the other ethnic groups. The Ukrainians, still speaking Ukrainian, all across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta say, you know, we, we got like a million Ukrainians here. Why aren't we being recognized? There's English, there's French, and there's what? Ukrainian! So now I want a big sign, English, French, Ukrainian. <laughs> and not only that, the Amerindians speak up and they say, what are you talking about? We were here first. So there's Cree, and you know, you know. And then the Inuits finally open their mouths. I mean, they weren't simply satisfied to, to make little art pieces for uh, art galleries in Toronto. I mean, they, they now open their mouth. Well, no, we're one of the founding races. So now, what Trudeau opened was Pandora's box. Ultimately, he will fall from power, and ultimately, they will try to handle it. In 1984, there comes to power a leader of the Conservative Party from Quebec. That's it. He speaks French. His name is Mulroney. Oh. Conservative party, but he understands the French. And now he does two things to try to calm things down. In order to divert attention from all this internal controversy, he says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to, together with the Americans and the Mexicans, create a North American free trade agreement which will absolutely help the Canadian economy because once the tariff walls are down, we'll be able to ship all our goods and if, if the economy improves, then people won't be so worried about whether they're speaking English or French. Wrong, but he didn't know that. So out of that comes the NAFTA agreement uh, uh, to which Canada becomes part and then he decides to negotiate a deal with Quebec. It was called the Meese Lake Agreement. It took place at a lake, like Cass Lake, <laughs> called Meese Lake, all right? Then there was a resort, so it's called the Meese, the Meese Lake Agreement. And the Meese Lake Agreement was to create a Canada in which all the provinces would have a lot of power of their own, but Quebec would have more. And he thought he could get it passed. Well, when the resolution was brought to Manitoba, and, and, and the, I mean, Manitoba said, no! Why should Manitoba have less freedom and autonomy than Quebec? 
So the whole thing came tumbling down. Mulrooney, who was a pretty handsome, articulate guy, goes off into oblivion. And the man who now shows up, the Conservative Party is down. The Liberal Party comes back with a French Canadian. His name is Chrétien. And Chrétien is not the greatest public speaker in the world. Some people think he's a little sleazy. Other people think he is just terrific. In 1993, after all this turmoil, all, after all this attempt to deal with the consequences of the Trudeau era, Chrétien takes over. And now Chrétien says, gives the Trudeau message. We're one Canada, I'm, I'm a French Canadian and I love being Canadian, this is one country and we're going to honor both English culture and French culture and maybe even the Ukrainians, who knows. What will persuade people to accept the message? Well, what the Liberals in Canada are in favor of is something that may keep the country together. It's the welfare system. Right? You may not like the English, or you may not like the French, or whatever else it is, but what? We're all tied together. So if you Quebecers want to leave, you just go leave. That means that all the money we make from oil and get the taxes you know, in Alberta, what? Will not go to you. Oh, well. Hmm. <laughs> What's more important, nationalism or money? Well, no, no, but, but, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very smart move. Do you, want, do you understand? It? It's, it's a strategy for keeping this mess together. And uh, in addition, he goes into Quebec and he says to the people in Quebec, what has all this furor done, done for you? And in fact, he's rewarded. In 2000, the Quebecers repudiate the Nationalist Party, and they put the Liberals into power. Oh, it's, that's all coming, it's all coming down. But then it hit. There was a lot of sleaze in Chrétien, and so there's scandal one, and then there's scandal two. It's public monies that are what? being misused, whatever it is. There's a lot of money floating around, and it's being misused. Scandal one, scandal two, scandal three. And then, in the middle of the scandals, George Bush decides to invade Iraq. So he calls up Chrétien, and Chrétien, now you have to understand, He's beginning to feel the lessening of power. How is he going to reinforce his power? One of the ways to reinforce his power is to appeal to one of the fundamental issues in Canada. How do you tell the difference between a Canadian and an American? So when Bush says, join us, he says, no. In fact, one of the ministers of his government calls Bush a moron. Do you remember that? No, 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 do, do, you, do you remember that? No, no, I mean, uh, what? she calls him a moron in public. I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> so uh, it, it is very clear that doing that is counterproductive to Canada's future because Canada has many issues with the United States. The United States is still under NAFTA can put up tariffs on timber and B, close out beef for reasons of uh, disease or whatever. So uh, there was a man, a member of uh, Krechen's government. His name is Paul Martin. Paul Martin's very interesting. Paul Martin was born in Windsor. His father, Paul Martin Sr., was the representative of the liberal representative from Windsor East. And for years and years and years and years and years, very capable politician. His son got the best education. He ultimately became a business executive in Montreal. He became the head of the Canada Steamship Company, and he decided to go into politics like his father. And he's very, very smart. And in 1993, Chrétien appoints him the finance minister. 
And, and Martin has people who say, you know what? We've got to get rid of Cray Chen because he's just, what, sleazy news. What we need is to get Martin in there. Martin will restore good relations with the uh, United States of America, the whole thing. We need, some, we need a smart guy like Martin, plus the welfare state is too expensive, and we need a businessman who, like Tony Blair, knows how to what? Shrink the welfare state. So now Martin organizes his cabal against Cray Chen. Cray Chen, on the other hand, doesn't want to give up power, so he fires Martin. Martin now organizes his thing, and now a big fight takes place in the Liberal Party. Ultimately, in 2003, Cray Chen says, all right, all right, all right. He says, all right, all right, all right, because he knows there are scandals yet to be exposed that he doesn't want to be the prime minister for. He says, all right, Paul, it's yours. So the next thing you know is, at the beginning of 2004, Paul is, elect, is chosen the leader of a liberal party and the successor to Cray Chen, and he becomes the prime minister of Canada and people are now saying, Paul Martin is going to pull this thing together. If you want to find out what he did, <laughs> come back in five minutes. All right. So now, one of the challenges that Paul Martin uh, faced when he came to power in February of 2004, I mean, uh, his problems were first that the United States of America was mad. Bush, by the way, wouldn't talk to Cray Chen. After he was called a moron by one of the, no, no, the members of the government, Bush would not talk to Cray. I mean, there was no communication. I mean, this is the closest country to the United States of America. So, um, alienated America. And in fact, uh, Bush had allowed certain uh, tariff walls to go up under NAFTA, um, keeping out, for instance, Canadian timber, which was a very, very uh, hard thing for the Canadians to, uh, to endure. And then mad cow disease was found in Canada, and that became the excuse to exclude all the Canadian cattle. All of it was part of this hostility that now the United States government felt toward Canada. Who can believe it? Uh, and all of it was reinforced by what happened at the American border after September the 11th. The Canadian border became one of the hardest borders in the wor world to cross. You have to bring your passport, right? Uh, your driver's license isn't good enough. They don't want to let the wrong people back into the country. Um, so, this alienation uh, produced an environment which wasn't good uh, for Canada. Canada, in the end, is dependent on the United States of America. No matter how you dot the I's or cross the T's, that's it. Some people have referred to Canada as the 51st state of the Union. The point is, it is economically tied and culturally tied. The third was that the separatists in Quebec are reviving. Um, they, in 1995, held a, a referendum in Quebec uh, in which the independence was rejected. But now they're back again. Uh, sensing the weakness of the government, do you understand that's what happens? If the central government becomes less strong, the separatists now become uh, stronger, so that now they're at it. Meanwhile, Cray Chen in 1993 experienced a liberal sweep so broad that he had a, ma a majority uh, in the Canadian Parliament of over 100. The Conservative Party almost disappeared and the New Democratic Socialist Party was shrunken. So, uh, he sailed along. I mean, the liberals did whatever they wanted to do. However, in the West, in Alberta, attempts were made to revive the Conservative Party. 
um, the people who had organized, who had come out of social credit, uh, who had come out of what we call the new oil economy, uh, who created this party that hated the separatists and Quebecists as an English country people, and many of these people were fundamentalist Protestants. So part of American Southern culture was now seeping into Canada, right? We call it the Christian right. Now change the name of their party for the umpteenth time, they call it the Alliance Party. And they try to win over the leftover conservatives, but they're working very hard. They finally, uh, after many trials, find a rather effective leader, his name is Stephen Harper. And his idea is to build on all the sleaze of the liberals and all the scandals of the liberals and all the annoyance in particular of English-speaking Canadians with these French Canadians who won't shut their mouth uh, to rebuild the Conservative Party. And it's beginning to be rebuilt because of all the trouble the Liberals are experiencing. And then comes the issue. Oh. In the middle of everything, the uh, courts in Ontario and British Columbia suddenly bring an issue into the whole thing that wasn't there. They suddenly declare that gay marriage is legal, that the prohibition of gay marriage violates the Canadian Constitution. So now there is a big demand. They, they've done it in Ontario, they do it in uh, British Columbia, and now they will authorize it later on in Nova Scotia. So now there's pressure on the central government to pass a law sponsored by the Liberals legalizing gay marriage all over Canada. And Chrétien, whatever his thing, he hates Bush. Is Bush opposed to gay marriage? He's what? He's for it. Got it? You know, sometimes you have relationships like that. Do you, know, you do understand? So, no, so you can get relationships like that. So he says, uh, we're for it and we're sponsoring a bill. Paul Martin says, don't do it. Don't, uh, don't, don't. He does, and then, avoiding the latest scandals and leaving the bill in the hands of Paul Martin, he what? Resigns. And now Paul Martin is in charge, and he now has to juggle this thing. He's the, the Liberal Party is committed to passing this law, and now screams, if you want to enlarge the Conservative Party in Canada, those Christian right people in Alberta, you gave them the what? The issue. Do you remember the election in the United States in 20? They now have the issue. And... Then comes the surprise. Oh. This is maybe the reason why Chrétien resigned. It's the great scandal, I mean. It involves millions and millions and millions of dollars. Unknown to the public, the Liberal government in Canada gave millions and millions and millions of dollars to advertising firms connected with the Liberal Party to create propaganda against the separatists and praising a united Canada. Millions of dollars. Not only is there the scandal in the fact that the people who got it were attached to the Liberal Party, the scandal is None of what was to be produced was produced. So where did the money go? Did it go into the coffers of the Liberal Party? Was it a kind of a laundering scheme? Whatever. I mean, millions and millions and millions. So Paul Martin now arrives, and he's got this reputation. This is the guy who's going to fix the thing with America. This is the guy who's going to fix the what? Um, the economy, the whole thing. After all, the economy is... Not that good because the, the cost of welfare is what? Increasing. The per capita cost of the health service in Canada is the highest in the world. 
higher than in France. And by the way, the system doesn't work. Thousands and thousands of doctors and nurses have fled Canada and moved to the United States of America. So now, there is antiquated equipment, uh, insufficient doctors and nurses, and now if you, you now walk in and you have a heart attack. So they say, well, if you'll come back. <laughs> In 15 days, if you'll come back in 15 days, just, you know, just wait 15 days, we'll what? We'll, we'll take care, we'll take care of you. So, I mean, but he's going to be Mr. Fix-It because he's going to be like Tony Blair. He's going to shrink the welfare economy to be able to persuade the people uh, in the whole thing. And now, you know, sooner comes to power than he's hit in the face with his leftover scandal that Chrétien most likely knew about and never told him about, and now he's held responsible, right? It most likely was authorized by Chrétien. So now the Liberal Party is viewed as the party of sleaze, and now he has to go to the public in an election, which he had called in order that the public could overwhelmingly elect him personally to power, just with the way Chrétien, and the election takes place in June of 2004. So the election takes place and it's an absolute disaster for the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party now ends up with a uh, hundred uh, and thirty-five members of the Parliament it does not, no longer has a majority. Which means we'll have to find allies. Well, the only allies around are the New Democrats, the Socialists, who increased, having been shrunken by Chrétien, because of the scandal, now increased their representation to 54. But if you have to ally yourself with the socialists, how are you going to shrink the, <laughs> the welfare? Got it? I mean, uh, the price of staying in power is you have to ally yourself with somebody who will forbid you to carry out the economic reform policies that you want to. I mean, the, the whole thing. Meanwhile, the conservatives who had been assigned to oblivion by Chrétien get 99. And there's a new party. The separatists now organize themselves in the federal election as a separate party. They will make deals with whoever will make deals with them. They call themselves the Bloc Québécois and they elect about 54 people to the parliament. Well, and they hate the liberals. They don't like the conservatives because the conservatives are for an English Canada. But you understand what happens in politics. The enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. So, now let me describe the mental state of Paul Martin today. <laughs> Do you understand? The, the government of Canada is in shreds. It cannot operate. The scandal simply grows by the day. I mean, every day, if you open up the Toronto Globe and Mail, there's another piece of this scandal that is unfolding. So it absolutely paralyzes the government. I mean, uh, it, just, it cannot move, it does not really enjoy a majority, it cannot carry out the economic reforms for which Paul Martin is famous. The conservatives are growing confident. They've made an alliance with, believe it or not, the French separatists. The conservatives are the English party. But in politics, you know, <laughs> everything happens, and now Paul Martin is being assaulted by the conservatives on an issue that sounds familiar. 
I want you to know that it's familiar. Paul Martin didn't choose it. He didn't ask the courts in Ontario and British Columbia and Nova Scotia to legalize gay marriage. It's out of the blue. I mean, well, don't these people know? Don't they understand? Be kind. They now have the issue of gay marriage, and the Liberal Party is now committed to this bill. To pull back would be what? To lose the support of all the people who uh, are in favor. It would humiliate the government. It would indicate that the government has obviously no consistency, no integrity, whatever it be. I mean, how, how are they going to do this? And now, out in Alberta, they're running around saying, look at this government, it's immoral. And what has now arrived in Canadian politics is the Christian right. So now let me describe the great irony in Canada. Historically, the place where the religious right existed was Quebec. Today, the easiest place to get an abortion is Quebec. <laughs> if you're Canadian and you want an abortion, you go to Quebec. The lowest birth rate is what? Quebec. The strongest feminist organization? <laughs> Quebec. You can't believe the change. So, oh, and the churches, nobody goes. So, however, out in the West, where there never was anything, do you understand? Now the Christian right has arrived, and now they're doing the same thing as the Christian right in America. They're infiltrating the conservative party, and now they've got an issue. How long Paul Martin can last, I don't know. I mean, there were such dreams for his success. So, right now, I can't go farther because that's where it was. <laughs> that's where it is. Um, Canada is in deep trouble because the only way that Canada can successfully stay together is that it has to have a strong central, a strong central government. And that strong central government has to be able to support a welfare state that is credible, but the central feature of the welfare state, the health service, is absolutely crumbling, and the economy is not good, and there's no political party that seems to have what? Control, and now the separatists in Quebec are back demanding independence. So, I do not know whether next year I'll be able to invite, at almost no cost, Paul Martin to come here to speak to us <laughs> at, the center, uh, at the Center for New Thinking. It is quite possible. Uh, what I do see, and it's rather interesting, is that in the long run, Despite all the resistance, Canada always imitates the United States. Do you understand? It follows. Its culture is Americanized, its speech is Americanized, and now its politics are getting to be uh, uh, Americanized. Uh, would I like Paul Martin to stay? I think, by the way, he has to go. He's, he's corrupted by a scandal he didn't create. <laughs> they need another Trudeau. If you bump into him on your way out, please let me know and the Liberal Party. Thank you all very, very much.
When Willem Alexander announced his engagement to Maxima Zorgieta, the whole country shared in their happiness. Shaking hands with people, sharing their feelings with them. The House of Orange has created a bond with the nation by mingling with the public. We usually see Queen Beatrix performing her formal duties, but she is a woman of compassion. In times of national tragedy, she represents the entire nation and shares in our grief and sorrow. At times like these, she gives comfort and solace. Collectors of House of Orange memorabilia are passionate about their collections. The House of Orange is part of their identity. Births, marriages, deaths and christenings in the royal family are national events. They affect us all. When Prince Klaus died, we felt we had lost a member of our own family. His funeral was an expression of our shared grief. The royal family and the people, it might seem we are one, but there are times that we are kept out. From talks at the palace between the queen and the ministers, for instance. Just how much power does the queen wield? Most countries have an elected head of state, a president, for instance, but the queen is our head of state. The Prime Minister, the most important person in the Dutch government, reports to the Queen every week. The Dutch monarch is part of the government, but he or she is not elected because the throne is inherited. An heir to the throne is born, not made. Over time, the monarch's political role has become smaller. Beatrix is primarily an advisor and source of inspiration. You can ask for attention things, and therefore it's good to know the problems as well as to know how much something is wrong or in the knell comes, or why people feel it as a problem. Het is ook soms moeilijk om te accepteren dat mijn rol een helemaal een andere is. Je moet het concreet aanpakken van problemen, met oplossingen zoeken, eigenlijk een andere overlating. This curious form of government, where the Queen is the head of state, but the ministers bear political responsibility, developed as the power of the House of Orange evolved. Holland is keine monarchy. Holland is a republic with a erblichen. First, der, der, der in eng contact with the people.
Queen Beatrix has many facets. She gives the traditional inscrutability of monarchy a human face. Though conscious of her royal duties, she remains human and accessible. And there is always that important task to fulfill, to represent the Netherlands with dignity. And to do that in the tradition of her illustrious ancestors, Queen Wilhelmina, Stadtholder King William III, and of course, the father of the nation, William of Orange. ontzettend hard. Wat heb je nou voor moois en voor romantiek en voor... Hè? Ik vind het geweldig als er Alexander trouwt. En dan gaan we de koets, sprookjesachtig. Ja, dat, dat vind ik gewoon, dat, dat verdienen we ook gewoon, dat verdienen hun ook. Dat, dat, dat vind ik machtig. Maxima Sorbieta, kronprins Willem-Alexander, prinses Maxima na vandaag. The Netherlands and the House of Orange, a fairy tale a whole nation believes in. We cherish our royal house. A 19th century commentator once said that there is something behind the throne that is greater than the king. As long as the members of the House of Orange enable us to experience that greatness, the House of Orange will be one with the nation. Ready for some fresh new lunch ideas? Then try salads to go. Salads are easy to prepare for lunch on the go and offer appealing, nutritious alternatives to the traditional sack lunch. Salad Bar Stir Fry provides a refreshing lunchtime change of pace. Like all our salads to go, the recipe serves one and it's easy to prepare. Just stop by your grocer's salad bar and select one quarter cup each of pea pods or bean sprouts, broccoli flowerettes, red pepper strips, and sliced bamboo shoots, and one half cup chopped cooked chicken. You'll also need one quarter cup of French dressing, one teaspoon soy sauce, one quarter teaspoon ground ginger, and one teaspoon of sesame seeds. In a skillet, Heat the French dressing, soy sauce, and ginger over medium heat for a quick yet tasty oriental stir-fry sauce. Stir constantly to distribute the seasonings and blend the flavors. Add the salad bar vegetables and chicken and stir-fry for three to five minutes or until the vegetables are crisp tender. By increasing the quantities in this recipe, you can create an excellent dinner entree with leftovers for lunch. Sprinkling the optional sesame seeds on top adds the final touch. That's all there is to it. Fill your lunch container with the stir fry. Serve chilled as a delicious oriental salad or reheat in the office microwave for a hot, nutritious meal. For a spicy lunchtime variation, try these south of the border salad burritos. You'll need two tablespoons of mayonnaise or salad dressing one half teaspoon ground cumin, a few dashes of hot pepper sauce, three quarters cup of finely chopped chicken, one carrot shredded, 
one quarter cup each of thinly sliced celery and chopped onion, two tablespoons of sliced ripe olives, and two outer leaves of iceberg lettuce. In a bowl, stir together the mayonnaise or salad dressing, cumin, and hot pepper sauce. Add the chicken, carrot, celery, onion, and olives, and stir until well blended. This is a good use for leftover chicken or turkey, too. To make the burritos, begin by removing the heavy base from each lettuce leaf. Then, place half the chicken mixture in the center, near the base of each leaf. Fold the leaf edges over the mixture and roll the leaf up for a convenient salad that packs easily as a sandwich. Salad burritos, a delicious salad that's ideal for lunch on the go. Quick tortellini salad can be served chilled or warm, whichever suits your lunchtime appetite. Here's what you'll need. One cup of cheese tortellini, a one cup frozen vegetable combination of broccoli, cauliflower, and carrots, one quarter cup of reduced calorie ranch style dressing, and one quarter teaspoon of Italian seasoning blend. First, cook the pasta according to package directions. Here's a quick tip for preparing frozen vegetables. Place the frozen vegetables in a colander, then drain the pasta over them. The hot water does the trick. Transfer the pasta and vegetables into a medium-sized mixing bowl. Add the dressing and the Italian seasoning. Toss until evenly mixed. Spoon the salad into your lunch container. Quick tortellini salad, another easy to prepare lunchtime alternative. For more helpful ways to make salads to go, contact the Association for Dressings and Sauces, Post Office Box 720-299, Atlanta, Georgia, 30358. What would you do if you had to choose between the buffalo and the giraffes, between a flower or an elephant? What would you choose? What if you had to decide between a hundred-year-old tree and a million-year-old beach? Between drinking clean water or breathing clean air? Would you make the right choice? Would there be a right choice? Now there's a way to help. Not just one, but all these things. Earthshare the world's leading environmental groups working together. It's one choice we can all live with. Ask your employer about workplace giving. My twin brother David was killed in a car accident uh, in rural Wisconsin and was instantly brain dead. And our family got a phone call um, probably about an hour after it happened. We had talked about organ donation. Uh, actually, my brother was the one that had brought it up. Knowing that those were his wishes, it wasn't scary. It wasn't a big deal. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So it was sort of like the most fitting tribute that, you know, his death, the final comment wasn't his death. It was that, you know, it was life. It was life affirming. A real paradise like this isn't easy to come by, but it does still exist. 